Well, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome once again to the JKMRC Friday Seminar Series. Uh, before we begin, on behalf of the University of Queensland and Sustainable Minerals Institute, we would like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Jagada people as the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection with country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. It's my very great pleasure today to introduce Dr. John McGoffey. John is the founder and president of Myra Geoscience. He has extensive mining industry experience focusing on quantitative, multidisciplinary, 3D and 4D interpretation for mineral exploration and geotechnical decision support. He currently leads Myra Geosciences technology strategy and a geotech business as well. Prior to founding Myra, Myra, <clears throat> prior to founding Myra Geoscience, uh, John spent 10 years in Naranda Technology Centre as a senior geoscientist in their rock mechanics group. And he, prior to that, he obtained an MSc in geological engineering and a PhD in geophysics from Queen's University. Today's presentation is entitled Machine Learning for Geotechnical Hazard Assessment. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. John McGoffey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. Uh, my name, McGoffey, is uh, Irish, so I like to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Even though I'm not Irish, I'm Canadian. My great-grandfather was Irish. Uh, pleasure to spend it here with you today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about machine learning, um, but I'm not going to be talking much about any uh, sort of complexities of machine learning. Machine learning is a whole world. Maybe some of you here today are, are uh, practitioners or experts in machine learning. I'm not going to go deep into that. What I want, one of the things I want you to take away from uh, the talk today is that the important part in applying machine learning to problems such as geotechnical hazard assessment is how the problem is set up. And that's really what I'm gonna be focused on, how the problem is set up. I'll talk about machine learning, um, but I'm gonna talk about it in a basic way. And I'm gonna do that in part because I also suspect some of you may not have much experience with machine learning. And what I'd like to do there is demystify it because it's full of you know, jargon and, and sort of high tech stuff. And there's stuff in the news all the time about AI and it all seems really complicated. And of course, as these things are, they do get they do get complicated uh, in their details. But the, the the basics, what we're trying to achieve with machine learning, is actually pretty simple. And what I'm going to show is that it can be effectively applied to geotechnical hazard assessment, and focus on how to apply it to geotechnical hazard assessment. Just a word about the term. I use the term machine learning or AI uh, uh, synonymously. Um, I know, strictly speaking, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, but you see these terms bandied around, big data, neural networks, machine learning, AI, everything. It's all kind of the same thing. Um, you know, again, if you're, a, if you're deep into the weeds of it and you're a practitioner, you, you'd probably object to that statement and say, no, it's not all the same thing. And of course, that's true at the very detailed level. Um, but for our purposes today, it's it, it it really is the same thing. And 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 what it's all about is learning to find patterns and data from which you can make useful predictions. That's what all machine learning is trying to achieve, no matter in what field it's applied in. Uh, and and that's actually the core of what we're trying to achieve, what anyone's trying to achieve with artificial artificial intelligence looking for patterns and making predictions. So let's think about the kind of problem that could be potentially uh, applied to in, in ge geotechnical, geotechnical hazard estimation. So what we're trying to do in our geotechnical hazard assessment strategy is quantify geotechnical hazard as a function of all those variables that we all know have an in an impact on geotechnical hazard. So I could write the equation like this in, in a sort of conceptual way and say that we know that hazard as a function of space and time depends on numerous variables. Right? And if you go to any site and talk about whatever it is, the, the prospect of pit slope failure or the 
prospect of rock bursting or roof fall in a coal mine, whatever the geotechnical hazard is, if you go to site and talk to the practitioners, the site experts, they'll quickly start talking about all of the things that correlate to or maybe predictive of hazard, right? And they'll start talking about geology and stress and rock mass characterization and mine production, perhaps, and geometry, all of these things that they know usually fairly qualitatively have an impact on the geotechnical hazard of interest. So our agenda really is to take that information, that conceptual information, that qualitative information and quantify it. And what we're trying to achieve very specifically is to write that equation. And the technique we're going to use to try and create that equation is the, the technique or the family of techniques of, of machine learning, which will enable us to understand which of those input variables correlates to the hazard, how it correlates to the hazard, how to weight the different inputs, and how to combine the different inputs. And all of that serves to give life to that equation. If we can do that, it, it, it has some fairly obvious value. It can, it can certainly help validate assumptions that people have on site. Uh, there are a lot of assumptions and in the work we've done, we've, we've I would say in 100% of the cases where we've <clears throat> done these exercises on site, we've validated a lot of assumptions that people on site had. We've also discovered things that they didn't know. So it has, it has great value for that. It assesses data importance and deficiencies. So, you know, what you learn is the relative importance of these input variables to the hazard in a quantitative way. So you understand which data sets are the most important and you understand whether the quality of the data you're collecting for those data sets that are important, whether that quality is sufficient or, or not. You may, use it to optimize monitoring. Again, if you find some data is particularly important, you may find that you don't have enough coverage. So it can affect the kind of data you collect and where you collect it. Evidence-based planning, this kind of equation can also, for many of the input variables that you would know ahead of time in a mine plan, such as geology, rock quality, planned mine geometry, modeled stress, if you can include those in, the, in this equation, if you've, if you've discovered a, a, a reasonable uh, approximation to an equation that you're happy with, you can use those quantitatively to estimate stress in your mind plan ahead of time. And it can also provide a dynamic input to the risk matrix, you know, the risk matrix, which, which you know, has consequence on one axis and, and probability of failure on, on the other. This directly impacts the probability of failure. And in fact, the output, the hazard estimation typically is that specifically. It's the probability of encountering the hazard. So we're going to try to do that with machine learning. And just a, a few words about machine learning. And I'm going to talk a little bit now just about sort of the basics of machine learning and, and how it works. And, and again, I'm going to try and demystify it in a useful way so that um, if you understand these very basics, then you can understand no matter what the machine learning method is, whether it's neural networks or something else, it's really trying to solve this, this same problem as I'll describe it. But a very important thing to know is that uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence is, is not is not like human intelligence. It has no understanding. It's all about pattern recognition. So the way I view it is, is, is like advanced statistics. So the statistics that I learned when I went to school, principal components and factor analysis, all that kind of stuff, useful stuff. To me, mach machine learning is just that sort of on steroids. It's taking that kind of technology to understand what relationships are amongst data and amongst data and outcomes and doing it in a more sophisticated way using more sophisticated mathematical tools. But at the end of the day, it's pattern recognition. When I think about applying machine learning to, to any of these geohazard problems or exploration targeting problems, because we apply the same methods on the exploration side, 
I always think of uh, cross plots like this, and it, it really helps uh, helps me to understand um, how to frame a particular problem on site in terms that we can apply these methods to. So if we think of, of, of a plot like this, those red dots are individual samples, right? And I'm just plotting them in a two-dimensional parameter space. I've just picked two variables, say rock quality and proximity to major faults. So you could imagine, you know, the, each of these samples could represent a piece of drill core, right? So you've measured RQ, RQD on that piece of drill core, and you've somehow measured how close it is to a major fault of interest that you think might be a problem, right? So all of those individual core samples will plot somewhere in that two-dimensional space. Of course, you can extend that to an n-dimensional property space or data space where you have many of these properties, then you can't draw it anymore. You can't draw the cross section, um, but drawing it as a cross plot is always very, very helpful to think of the problem as being a two property problem and then just extend it to more properties. So we have observations from some point X, Y, Z, and I'll show you later in the presentation how we, how we extend that to time. So in fact, these are our observations at X, Y, Z, T. T is important because geology do doesn't change perhaps, or RQD probably doesn't change or change much, but stress changes, micro seismicity changes, ground deformation changes, all sorts of things change. So some of these properties change in time, some don't, but because some do, you have to include the fourth dimension. But for now, just think of it as individual samples in, in, in a space. And what we do in, in machine learning, and this is true of any kind of machine learning, whether it's the spam filter on your email or, or if it's chat GPT, doesn't matter. It's, it, you can think of, of taking these problems and you build what uh, we call a data fusion table. And in practice, this table tends to be just a big CSV like ASCII file. It's a flat uh, two-dimensional table, which has properties as columns and observations as rows, right? So if I think of each of those dots, each of those samples as being a row in my table, my data fusion table, I get a table like this, and we're gonna come back to this several times in the talk. So we have multiple observations, and in a typical geotechnical hazard back analysis problem, we would have millions of observations, at least hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of rows of this table. So these are the individual observations in space and time. Each observation is a particular X, Y, Z, T, each row. And then we've got a series of properties that are measured, properties of interest at, at, that, at that point. And then in a back analysis problem, we have to understand whether a hazard occurred at that X, Y, Z, and T or not. And then we just flag that in a final column. And this is really the problem setup. Right? And then you can take a flat ASCII table like that, CSV file, and you can take that to any kind of machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, program. You know, get your Python or R out and start applying neural networks or random forests or you know, whatever you want. I mean, there are so many techniques in machine learning, but they all take the input file that looks like that. Right? And that's the crux of the problem is how do you build that? And that's the, that's the important thing that I really want to get across today. But let's look again quickly at, at what this looks like in, in a two-dimensional space, a two-parameter space, to give you a feel of what the machine learning algorithm applied to that big flat ASCII table is going to do. So there are two kinds of, of machine learning. Actually, there are three, but there are two main ones, unsupervised and supervised learning. And in unsupervised learning, what you're trying to do is, is you're, you're looking at that space and you're looking where the samples fall in it. And you're just trying to decide whether or not they're falling into groups, useful groups for interpretation. The most common unsupervised machine learning algorithm almost certainly is k-means clustering, but there are many others. There's hierarchical clustering, there's self-organizing maps, there's all sorts of uh, unsupervised learning methods, but they all try and do the same thing. They all try and take your samples, which are in that parameter space, and sort out whether or not they belong in, in meaningful groups or clusters, as, as, as this one's called. In k-means clustering, you have to uh, 
pre-select the number of clusters and you, you can test different ones. In this case, if you pre-selected five clusters and said, okay, well, machine learning algorithm, divide my data into five groups, it would probably come up with these five groups and those means, the k-means are where those green crosses are. Those are the, the centroids of the groups in parameter space. You can see if you've got dozens of parameters, this gets a little complicated. I can, you can draw it easily in, in two dimensions, but in dozens of dimensions, it's, it's, it's more difficult. So this is where the sort of tricks could come in, in in applying machine learning. But this is the principle of it. And we use this all the time in geotechnical hazard. We'll just take the data and, and say, okay, where does, it, where does it all fall in this parameter space? And does it fall into natural groups? And we've got many examples where you'll have, say, rock bursts and they fall into multiple groups and you say okay well the ore zone rock bursts are statistically meaningfully different from the rock bursts in the footwall development because we can just see they fall into different groups in this multi-dimensional parameter space and as a practitioner that tells you well if, if they're falling into different groups i kind of have to treat them as different problems because the statistical relationships between the parameters and the outcome, the hazard will be different for those two groups. So if I think back to my original hazard equation, I'd have two hazard equations then, one for the ore zone and one for the foot wall. Right? For example, if you're in an open pit, different structural zones around the pit may have different hazard equations. And this is a way of testing that. So if we had many observations, I, and just to take that simple example, if I just had drill hole core and had RQD in proximity to a major fault model, and I started posting all those in this two-dimensional space, and then colored them by whether or not something bad happened, whether it was hazardous or whether it was, it was not hazardous, whether it was stable, maybe I'd start to see some patterns, right? And this is what machine learning explores. And this is really all it is. It's just exploring that. But it's exploring that with many, many points. If I, if I said there was millions of rows in that table, there's millions of points in this plot. And if I said there were dozens of columns, then this plot is not two dimensional, it's, it's you know, 20 or 30 dimensional. So that's, that's, that's what machine learning is. All it is is, is trying to sort this out. So supervised learning is, is not just looking for groups of data, it's where you have data that's labeled. If you use the machine learning jargon, they talk about labeled data. This data is labeled, so I've labeled my samples with something of interest. If I was trying to build a junk mail detector, I'd be labeling these in the training phase, junk or not junk, and then I'd have different parameters, which may be different collections of words or something on the axes, and I'd be trying to figure out where things lie. But you can see right away that if, if in, in this example, there is a difference between where the hazardous and the non-hazardous points fall, but it's not clean, right? I've got some hazardous, got three hazardous points there in the middle of non-hazardous points, so how do you separate that out? Maybe you can't, but supervised learning is is going through uh, a plot like this in multiple dimensions and trying to find rules or expressions that would enable you to isolate where the points of interest, the hazardous points are, and that's what that's really all we're doing. Just to show you a couple of examples of this, one of the common machine learning methods and supervised learning is called weights of evidence or a naive Bayes uh, approach. And all it's doing is, is saying, okay, well, for property number, property number one, which was RQD in my example, said, well, it, the threshold is best here. Right? And it would help you pick where that threshold should be that best separates the green dots from the red dots, just on, on the basis of one property. You can't do it perfectly on one property. But then you can add a second property, and the second property, which was proximity to fault, says, "Well, it's going to cut. It's going to put a threshold here, and say, well, the green dots are mostly under that, and the red dots are mostly over that.' You see, that's not quite right exactly, but that's what it's going to come up with with one variable. But once you start combining variables, it gets a little bit better, right? So if you combine two variables, now you've got four quadrants, right? Um, and and you've 
got a quadrant here that's of particular interest. You could say, well, if my data falls in this quadrant, if my RQD is less than this, and my proximity to the fault is less than C2, then I'm in this quadrant. And I can see now that my probability of that being hazardous is much higher than being here or here, or perhaps here. Actually here, I don't have any data. I don't know anything. And if you've got multiple properties, then you know this breaks into two, two to the M where M is the number of properties. So if you've got 20 properties, you, you, you know, it, it gets, it gets complicated fast. <clears throat> uh, random forest is probably the most common supervised learning approach uh, that we see in, in, in practice, at least in the geosciences. And it's very similar to what I showed previously with a, with, with a couple of differences. One is rather than just finding a single threshold for each property, what it does is it first picks a threshold for say property one. So if this was RQD, it would say, well, okay, we're gonna split it here and say the hazardous side is RQD under that value and the non-hazardous is over that value. And then it's gonna take the second property and it's just gonna focus on the hazardous space here and it's gonna pick a threshold here. So it's gonna say if the proximity to fault is in this range and, and now you've got, well, the proximity to fault in that range here, and RQD in that range there, now you're better able to, to focus in on, on what's hazardous. And you can, I think, see how this makes a decision tree. Is property one greater than A, yes or no? And if no, then is property two less than any, Anyway, you can just follow a decision tree. And random forests is, is just a collection of decision trees. A lot of trees make a forest. So it's, it's, it's taking the same approach and it's 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 randomizing what property you start off with and and if it's it's changing a few other things to build an ensemble of decision trees which are then combined into a best estimate of 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 uh how to determine where the hazardous zones are in this multi-parameter space there are other methods we've uh, played around with one called hypercube which is a more brute force approach which is looking directly not uh, property by property, but looking at all proper properties simultaneously to see if there are concentrations of the hazardous uh, zones within that multi-parameter space, and it would create what it calls a rule. Property one is between A and B, and property two is between C and D, and that makes a nice tight little box around the hazardous zones. And then you can have other rules and say, well, maybe this is a rule too. And, and, you know, one of the benefits of this is you get these rules out that are written directly in terms of things like RQD and proximity to faults. And, and as, you know, thinkers in geomechanics, you can think about the significance of those and decide whether to discard them or not. And then there's, you know, lots of, you know, parameters in, in the processing that tells you things about, you know, how strong the signal is for, for particular rules, how much it should be trusted. But this is what all of these machine learning things are doing. Right? So again, the, 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 the real crux of the matter is how do you construct that multi-parameter space? How do you construct that flat ASCII table as input to any of these machine learning tools? So we're looking at patterns and uh, we're saying that there's a lot of value to this kind of pattern recognition, even though it isn't you know, intelligence itself but it does find correlations amongst data sets and the conditions that we're, we're looking for, the hazard conditions. It does create useful statistical models that combine these data sets in a quantitative way. It does establish the relative importance of the individual input data types qualitatively, quantitatively, I mean, and it can really serve to confirm or refute assumptions concerning the relationships. And this is in a large part of what we found most useful because we'll do these analyses, go back to the site and discuss it with the site people. And again, as I, as I said earlier, a lot of it is like, yeah, we knew that, we knew that, we knew that, but yeah, we didn't know that. Or, or we have this other kind of data and we're just not able to properly use it in this kind of framework because of the condition of the data or it's not, it's, you know, not nearly extensively sampled to be useful or whatever ever the reason, but does really shine a light on, on the data and the relationships of the data to the thing of interest. So how do we do it? How do we construct this flat ASCII table and then uh, send it to machine learning? 
So number one is we have to capture some kind of 40 historical state of the mind because we need this time dependent factor, right? We need to know what the stress was or the geometry was or ground deformation was at the time when these hazards occurred. We have to capture the historical record of the geohazards, which is often easier said than done. Uh, we need to understand the relationship between the data and, and the hazard. And, and what this means is we have to find a way to create these samples in this multi-parameter space from all of these individual uh, data types. And we'll talk about that in a moment. From that, we then apply it to forecast the likelihood of geohazard events. So we build that equation so that we can apply it to future data sets and predict the probability of hazard. And then finally, to truly deploy it, we, we establish a system uh, like an IT or software system to automatically update the state of the mine and prepare new hazard forecasts, typically, typically on a daily basis. So the workflow, define the problem, feature engineering, that is a machine learning term of art. Uh, feature engineering means how do you create the variables on those samples. Sometimes it's not as simple as just what was the RQD at that, on that piece of core. Here's an example. You've got RQD in your drillable database, but you want to use RQD on the points in the mine where the hazard happened where you have not sampled RQD. So how do you do that? That's the feature engineering problem. The data fusion problem is bringing it all together, the co-location in space and time. So you have all of those features on those samples at X, Y, Z, T, so you can build that table. Then the analysis, which is the machine learning part, and then the, then the deployment. And I can tell you that these are the harder parts, the parts up front. The machine learning part is, I won't say trivial, but it's, it's the easy part of these projects. So problem definition, I'll just go through these, these steps just to give you a feel of, of, of what we do. Uh, first of all, understand the hazard type. What are we looking at? We're looking at rock burst. Well, is it a fault slip induced rock burst? Is it a strain burst? Or if it's a ground fall, what kind of ground fall is it? You know, are these different problems? Or are these the same problem? Uh, what kind of, of things in general do we think may correlate to the hazards? Structure, rock type, rock quality, stiffness, blasting. So we typically have uh, 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 sessions where we um, really work with the site people to understand those things, to, to, to define the problem. And in doing so, these are, these are the key takeaways. Never mix the hazard types in the analysis. Don't, miss, don't mix fault, slip, induced rock burst with strain burst. They're fundamentally different. They have different mechanics. They have different statistical relationships to the properties. <clears throat> um, if it's sl slope failure, don't, don't mix, uh, you know, one bench with a, a total slope failure. Those are, they're, they're different problems. You gotta understand what you're looking at. You gotta brainstorm with site personnel to understand what kind of data or what kind of factors uh, do you want to include as potentially correlative to those, to those hazards. We use statistical tools to do a lot of uh, pre-processing to try to validate uh, relationships between data and, and hazards, and also to understand correlations amongst the input data sets themselves. You don't want multiple input data sets that are all highly correlated to each other, just overweighting kind of the same thing. And then typically in these projects, you're doing a lot of revision as you go. You're testing things, you're going back to site, you're talking to people, you're making adjustments. The feature engineering is the mapping uh, data sources to individual hazard criteria. And, and what I mean by that is uh, data sources are things like this. You've got geological and geotechnical block models. You've got wireframes, drill hole databases, mine developments. You've got all this data. And, and, and people say, oh, I've got this database, that database. And, and great. But how do you get all of that data into actual variables that you can represent in the columns of that table? Or, or on the points, those sample points, right? How do you do that? Because these things are on fundamentally different supports, a block model and a drill hole database and geological wireframes and mine infrastructure wireframes, they're, they're all on different, what we'd call mathematical supports, different geometries. Somehow you gotta get all these things together. And getting them all together is, is, the, 
is the data fusion problem. <clears throat> so this is the way we do it. We have to find some kind of digitization of, of the mine, and the digitization has to occur at the rock interface. The, the hazard always occurs on the rock interface, never occurs in the solid rock volume, right? You don't have a rock burst 100 meters into the rock away from the drift. You have the rock burst in the drift. You have the slope failure on the slope, not, 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 in, not in the wall. Um, however, there may be things in that rock mass that are, are distant from where the rock burst is experienced that you have to somehow encode into the sample, the digitized sample of the mine geometry where the rock burst will, will, will happen. So this is, a, this is one example from an underground mine. I like to show this slide just because this shows how still in the 2020s, we might get data from a mine, right? AutoCAD drawings, colored pencil, still happens. <clears throat> um, so here we digitize, uh, typically uh, something like a two meter interval, on, on typically on mine center lines, if it's a rock burst problem in an underground mine. And, and then what the game is, is okay, we're gonna digitize on those mine center lines and we have to build variables that capture all of these things that we think may be related to the probability of a rock burst happening as quantitative properties at each of those points. And that's actually the trickiest part of the whole problem. How, how do you do that? That's the feature engineering problem. Feature engineering, general machine learning term for establishing variables on the samples. But for us, this is what it means, is creating these, creating these quantitative variables in all these samples. And eventually we're gonna have to have a record of whether or not a hazard, the rock burst, occurred at each of those points. This, this is a quote from a machine learning textbook. I just like it because I, I think it really just underlines what the, the hardest part of the problem is. At the end of the day, some of these projects succeed and some fail. What makes the difference? Easily the most important factor is the features used. S easily the most important factor in whether or not you're gonna be able to forecast rock burst hazard reliably is how have you encoded these individual variables on those mine center line digitized points? And remember, they're coming from all of these different data sources, drillable databases, right? The resource model, which is a block model, the geological wireframes, the you know, all blasting records, production records, it's all coming from different places. You've got to get all that data onto those individual points. Somehow, that's the feature engineering, and that's where these projects succeed or fail. Just to give you an idea of what we have to do to do that, this is the modeling phase where we take things like, I think some, they might see on site, well, microseismic is important, and, and typically microseismic is important for, for things like rock burst uh, analysis, and, and uh, we would develop maybe 40 or 50 variables from a microseismic data set and post those on those individual points. Yeah. One of them might be microseismic event density. This is from an old project. This is Tautona mine in South Africa. Um, and here we're looking at microseismic events as bubbles, and, and here at microseismic event density is in, in, in a 3D voxelized representation, and there's an isosurface around a certain concentration. And in this case, we're actually looking at proximity from the face where we're trying to evaluate rock burst hazard to the edge of this uh, isosurface of microseismic event density at some threshold. So you got to play around with these things and you have to do these the modeling. This is how you go from a microseismic database into digitized points or features on, on, on the mine model. Stress, this is actually from Brunswick Mining in Eastern Canada, another old project. Uh, so this, so we want to digitize on the mine center lines, but first we take the stress model. This is from a UDEC model. What's shown on this plane is deviatoric stress. These are the uh, uh, these are the sigma one vectors, just for visualization. But um, we're taking some kind of stress parameter, and, and deviatoric stress is one we often take, and we're modeling it in three D from the stress models, and then we're posting it or projecting it onto those those individual points on the mine center lines that represent where the rock burst may occur. 
This is from another mine. This is extraction ratio. This, so this is using one of our modeling tools. And, and these are the kind of tricks we do. This is floating a sphere of a certain radius around a wireframe and stops at every vertex on the wireframe and figures out how much of that sphere is in solid rock versus excavated rock, uses the ratio as, um, as one measure of extraction ratio, which is a, typically a pretty good proxy to local stress anomalies. So that extraction ratio is a pretty good variable to use. But again, this is this is the, the, the feature engineering process. It's the longest part of any, extra, any, any of these projects. And this gives you an, an idea from, uh, this is for underground mining, but the kinds of things we typically look at, I don't expect you to read all those, but just to, to take on board that we look at a lot of them and we look at all the data that's there and we try and find representations on the digitized mine center line of all of these variables somehow. And then we create the data, uh, the data fusion table. And, and to do that, we, we take the digitized mine center lines at a series of time snapshots where hazards had occurred previously. So if we've got like 10 dates, maybe where rock bursts occurred, we'll take 10 snapshots of, of the mine over the last, say, couple of years when the rock bursts occurred. We'll combine all of those as individual rows in that data fusion table. And uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll create that extra column at, on the data fusion table that flags whether a hazard occurred at that spot in that time or not. So we have to go through this process of, of going from the mine model snapshots, so that's the center lines with all those properties on them over a series of times into that, that data fusion table. Yeah, it kind of looks like this. We look at multivariate block models, or this is showing five timestamps, just to give a sense of, of, of how we handle time in these problems. And then we build this table. So again, this table will have, because it's got the, the mine center lines digitized every two meters over multiple snapshots in time, that's how you get to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of rows. And then you have all of these features you've built that capture the state of each of those variables at each of those observations, X, Y, Z, T, and then whether a hazard occurred there or not. There are other tricks I'm not gonna get into and in how you define whether a hazard occurred there or not, um, but that's part of the, the processing as well. And in practice, we, we, we do this through software, right? So we've got a data management system that has automated data fusion capabilities, um, capabilities of bringing data together and, 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 and building these tables. And those tables look like this in the software. This is, this is uh, just a web browser view of, of a data fusion table, and you can see X, Y, Z. And then you can just see what these, these are just quantitative properties, distance to fault intersections, microseismic peak particle velocity, shortest distance to blasts, sum of energy, vertical distance under topo for this particular mine. It's four dimensional because this representation is as of a certain date that the user can pick here and they can pick what level they're showing or you know, whatever they wanna show in the table. And then we go on to the analysis and we do a lot of uh, pre-processing, uh, pre-analysis to understand how the variables are working in the model. So this is now just analyzing that big ASCII file, that table. So this is an example from a more recent project. And I was to say, count of stopes blasted within the last three months within 200 meters of a rock burst. So these are variables that are sort of dreamt up in, in, in discussion with the site people, right? And then you've got to take the, the blasting database and then you've got to figure it all out. Um, but this, this is the kind of thing that we love to see when we start analyzing the table. In red here is the distribution of that variable count of stopes blasted within the last three months within 200 meters of a hazard four mine center line points that experienced a rock burst and in blue is the the mine center line points that did not so quite clearly and immediately you can see that variable has value Man, that's that is really showing a difference in statistical distributions for points that had a hazard or didn't have a hazard and that's what we want to see and then we just submit this to the machine learning. And, you know, we'd get the, if we used Hypercube, which was one of the ones I showed earlier, we'd get, you know, something like this. This is just showing 
you know, two dimensions again, two properties, but you've got lots of different points. So the X's, your rock bursts occurred where the X's are and didn't where the O's are. And you're starting to create rules. You're, you're exploring that space to see what combinations of these properties tend to give you a higher probability of having a, a hazard. And then these are the kind of rules that come out of, you know, this is sort of midpoint through the processing for something like that. This is rule number seven for which combined, you know, what is it? Six different criteria, blast density, distance to copper ore, distance to drift intersections, uh, dip of joints, with the dip direction between 175 and 185 degrees, distance to all fault intersections, distance to faults, fault segments that had a high fault slip tendency. And then the, the individual bounds in that parameter space. And then uh, this corresponded to fall of ground, six, four, seven, nine, fifteen, and one eleven. I mean, this is just the kind of now you're into it, right? With but this is the exploration of that of that table. And the output then is 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 a hazard assessment. This is combining all of those different properties back onto the mine infrastructure and showing it in in color as 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 hazard. So red is high hazard, blue is low. And this is the kind of outputs you would get from, this is a very standard machine learning kind of output efficiency of classification that tells how well or how predictive the result is. And in this case, it shows me that, you know, with, I'm not gonna go detail on the curve, but, but the result of this curve is, is that 80% of the historical rock bursts occurred within the top 10% of the, of the hazard probability. So that's pretty good. And then on to deployment. And then what we do is we try and automate this. Once we define the hazard equation, we want to apply it automatically as new data is coming in. So we built a system called Geoscience Integrator, which is a data man management system that can take in new data automatically, update, recompute the features, and combine them into a hazard estimation and push that hazard estimation out to, to users on, on site. And typically that's done every, every day where it's deployed every 24 hours and the microseismic data is changing this kind of data deformation data is changing so we update the hazard and and this is another schematic that sort of shows generally how it works there's a live connection to the input data on site there is this centralized server which is now often in the cloud somewhere uh, there's 3d spatial modeling on the server because it has to compute things like with the microseismic data that's being updated, how close are we to this or how close are we to that? Then we're applying the uh, machine learning uh, formulation that was created from the data fusion table. The data fusion table itself is updated automatically, rows are being added to it every day, and then hazard reports are, are created and sent out typically by email. Just another schematic, just to give you a sense of, of what needs to be built to, to actually deploy this in, in an operational automated sense. Uh, you need this consolidated data warehouse, which can take in all kinds of data and as well as non-spatial data and then do something with it. So as the last slide showed, those spatial computations are being done right in the 40 data warehouse. The hazard equation that's being developed is being applied to those uh, to the new rows of the tables that are being created. And then it's being uh, it's being sent out in, in, in some 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 way. There's various visualization and processing things attached to it. But um, in 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 most places where it's deployed, the people on site aren't aren't really using this in any kind of daily way. They're they're using the the daily integration outputs, which are being sent by email. And then every year or so they're asking to, to have the back analysis updated if other hazards, other rock bursts or whatever had occurred, uh, can we update the, the hazard equation? Has it changed? Uh, just another couple of uh, slides from the software just to, to, to get a sense of how this is, is, is automated. So this is the mine model compilation, which can be uh, shown like this as, the, as a kind of representation of that flat ASCII table. But also you can show it uh, as either a mine level plan or as a, if it's a pit, you can show it as, as a pit geometry. So these are the individual points, right? individual points that were digitized for a pit example. 
And on each of these points, you have all of these sorts of properties calculated and automatically updated. And it's those properties that are then combined into the hazard estimation, which is what's shown in color. And this is the kind of setup that's done in, in the software, again, to give you a sense of it. So in this case, there's 142,000 points on the, in the mind model. So those would be the digitized center lines, perhaps, or the digitized pit. In this case, it's digi digitized center lines in, a, in an underground mine. And here you see that you've got uh, a number of system computed properties. So these are the, are the properties that are being recomputed every day. And it tells you you know, when the last calculation was, when the next scheduled calculation is. And is, anyway, it's a bunch of stuff, different parameters around it. But this is this is the kind of stuff that's done that has to be done automatically if, if you're updating the hazard reports automatically, which in practice we have found is required for people to use this stuff <clears throat> operationally. And this is within the software as well for a particular hazard. I mean, you can call these whatever you want, and you can have multiple hazards uh, on the same mines. This one's just generically called rock bursts. It tells you when the last calculation was, when the next calculation will be. You can see this one's set up to be calculated weekly, every Monday at 6 a.m. And uh, then there's just a bunch of sort of quantitative information about about the rules. So th this is actually, you know, we talked about that hazard equation on the very first slide, hazard X, Y, Z, T equals all of these different variables. Th this, this is that done, quantified. This is how deviatoric stress comes into that equation, how distance to development blasts copper grade. I mean, right from the resource model, we find that copper grade had an impact, microseismic distance to hanging wall distance door contacts, so lots of different variables. So this is the data integration done, right? Geology, engineering, monitoring, it's all brought together. And these are the kinds of report, this is in the web browser uh, uh, view, but this is the kind of thing that's captured as a PDF and sent out in those daily reports. Um, in this case, it's looking at a particular sub-level of a mine. These are the digitized mine center lines. And, you know, you can, a user can pick what level they're looking at, what day they're looking at, and what property they're looking at, because all of these properties, the input properties are, of course, on these points. That's the data fusion. And this is the Rockburst hazard in index that's being displayed. And if it's over 50, that's the particular score here, then it's displayed as a larger point to draw the eye immediately to hazards that may be, may be anticipated. And what this gives the, the site people perhaps every day is just to look at that and then they can think about it and they can they can investigate what what the inputs are that made that go high and they can decide what to do about it maybe nothing maybe they'll you know rearrange production for that day uh, but it gives them something to think about it's it's a tool and this is what it looks like in the 3d visualizer which is geoscience analyst which is part of the integrator system and, and this is Analyst, which I think some of you may use, but you, I don't think you use it connected to Integrator. This is what it looks like connected to Integrator, where you've got this full sort of Integrator query panel, which is similar to what you saw in the web browser previously. This is the data fusion table right there. And then you've got a, a view into the entire database as, as a geoscience analyst object tree that you can query or whatever. So that's it. That's what we started with. We have a hazard equation that we want to go from the qualitative to the quantitative. We're going to use machine learning and the, the thinking behind machine learning to go from these different sort of buckets of data types into some kind of quantitative representation through a back analysis framework to, to give real quantitative meaning to that equation and then give it back to the mind on a time frame that they can use operationally. So my final slide conclusion, sort of takeaways, uh, machine learning is, is pat pattern recognition. That's important to know. And that's true of any artificial intelligence on its own. It's, it doesn't replace human understanding, but it's a great tool. It's better than principal component or factor analysis, which is again, what, what I learned when I went to school. Um, it can lead to really significant insights. And we've seen this on multiple projects, as long as the, the data sets are well modeled, um, you've got 
the proper number of variables. If it's a well-conditioned problem, you can really do some fantastic things. And that model preparation and problem formulation, the feature engineering really um, are the most important parts of this problem. The actual algorithms, whether it's weights of evidence or neural networks or whatever, they're less important. Although on that, I'll just say one thing. Um, people will um, say, I think rightly so, that deep learning kind of neural network approaches are more predictive in some formal way, they're better than uh, simpler approaches like the, the, the Bayes, Bayesian approaches or weights of evidence type approaches. However, um, those simpler methods give you a direct link from input to output. And we've learned that that is extremely important on the mind. If you apply neural network to that same flat ASCII file, you may get a more predictive hazard equation, a better hazard equation in some way, but you'll have no idea what the what that equation is. All you'll know is that it seems to work, but you don't know what it is. You don't know how deviatoric stress was used in it. You don't know how support or geometry was used in it. All you know is that you have a prediction result. And what we've learned is that that doesn't fly on the mind. They wanna know, they wanna be able to say, okay, the hazard is high there, why? And, and have an understanding of that so they can act on it. They can make their own judgment. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, if you're watching online, please uh, raise your hand and we will um, elevate you to ask a question. But is there any questions in the audience here? A great talk. Thank you very much. Very impressed with the amount of work that's gone into, you know, this is a huge undertaking. I'm interested in, in your commentary around the areas of uh, cost and the decision making around the investment. You know, which customers said, yes, we want to go on this path, we want to go on this journey. And then how does that actually fall back into, like when you've had a major pit failure, you go, oh my God, we would have spent millions if we could have known this was going to happen and actually uh, uh, made it not happen. Uh, that's dead easy. But until someone's had a failure, they're very unlikely to want to spend the money and invest in building the platform and the capability beforehand is my own experience. So just interested in your commentary or sort of and thinking and, and what happened there in that space. Yeah. So, um, yeah, two, two comments uh, in response. One is uh, the customers that have... Um, really bought into this are, are the ones that have had severe problems, right? They've already had severe problems. And 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 in some cases, I, I wouldn't say they're at their wits end, but but they they um whatever they they've they've done prior to 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 this hasn't satisfied them. So they've taken taken this step. Um, the second comment is uh it's not that expensive. I mean it was expensive to uh, actually more and time consuming, I guess, to develop. It was done through a lot of uh, research projects and things like that over a period of about a decade. Um, but actual deployment to, to a site is, is not that expensive. I mean, it takes a, a consulting job uh, that would be, let's say a uh, hundred days of total time to do everything. Um, in terms of uh, like consulting labor, that, that always goes over many months because people's data is a mess, right? You say, oh, we need your blasting records. Well, okay, they're in the filing cabinet. We need your support history. Eh, that might be in the AutoCAD drawing somewhere. And that, that, that takes time. So it's usually, a project usually takes about a year uh, because of the issues of data availability. The data availability problem actually is cured for those sites that do this for any future work, for anything, right? For any consultant to do anything, because once you have that database, you can just say, bring me the, where's the support data, the microseismic data, the, the whatever data, it's all, it's all there. Um, so it's not that, it's not, it's not that expensive. And then there's an annual sort of cost to just having the system running, which again is, you know, much, 
much less costly than a single employee. <clears throat> I think uh, we have a question online now from Ashkan. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so first I wanted to obviously thank uh, the John. Uh, obviously, the, as he said, uh, there is so much talk in different companies and like the, talking about like using uh, AI and machine learning in geomechanics, but usually it's just talks, you know, that's just a presentation and everyone gets excited and the day later everyone forgets about it. But I congratulate John that actually he made a, like a fully functional product and you know it's, it's a financial viable and like minds are actually using it. It's a it's a huge accomplishment in my idea. Uh, I had uh, two small questions that I, I was wondering if uh, he can help me with. Uh, one of them was that based on what I understood from your presentation, most of your products are basically uh, unsupervised machine learning and mostly clustering and uh, those kind of type. Uh, am I correct or? No, most most of it's supervised machine learning, right? With, yeah, with labeled data where the label is whether the hazard occurred or not in, in the back analysis. So is it is it like a binary prediction? Is it like if it happened or not? Or is it in terms of the... Uh, yeah. Like a... so, so each... Each uh, run of the machine learning exercise is binary. Um, however, uh, we will often look at many individual binary problems to understand which one's working. So for example, for, for uh, rock bursting. So in, in recent uh, uh, projects we've done in underground mines with rock bursts, they tend to use this um, uh, rock burst severity scale that's been developed. I can't remember who developed it uh, some years ago. So it's uh, R1 to R5, and there's a definition of what R1, it's a damage assessment. So that's how, how, how the, we uh, quantify the hazard. And then what we'll do in, in the machine learning is we'll say, okay, if they've got a database and they understand the damage extent from the rock bursts, let's look at Let's look at the problem where we define hazard, the binary hazard as being hazardous, as any kind of hazard, R1 or above. And then we'll separately, we'll look at, say, just R4 and R5, or just R5, which is the most severe hazard. So we'll do multiple runs. And then we also look at differences, uh, uh, you know, in spatially in the mine like in a block cave mine we would look at the undercut and extraction level separately and then we would combine them so we did look at lots of different permutations or i mentioned a case in another underground mine where the unsupervised learning indicated that there was a difference in the statistics of correlation between the input variables and the rock burst depending on whether you're in the ore zone where actually the ore was like a softer material or in the brittle footwall development um, and we treated those as separate problems. But each of those problems is, is a binary problem, but we may look at multiple versions of the binary problem at any site. Yeah, awesome, thank you. And the second question just uh, quickly was that- uh... my, my apologies, Ashkan. Uh, we have actually run out of time um, oh, okay. seminar no. and we have had the lecture theater booked uh, for a talk immediately after, so my apologies. Um, could uh, I'd just like everybody to join me in thanking Dr. John McGohey for uh, this excellent talk. Uh, next week, we have Dr. Marcos de Paiva Bueno, who is the founder and CEO of Geo Paora, and staying on the theme of rocks breaking, but moving into intentional breaking of rocks next week. Uh, he will be talking about recent advances in rock breakage characterization testing. Uh, we hope to see you all again there. Thank you very much.